Okay, hi everyone. I'm going to present the chapter five, which is about, uh, it's called spending our data. It's, it's about how we uh, split our data that we can use for the modeling process between training and, and testing the, the model and, and models mainly. Uh, so I think, I think we can, we can dive right in. And uh, yeah, so feel free to ask ask any questions even during during which I I speak. So so feel free. Uh, so this is uh, this nice uh, chart is about like the whole modeling process. It's and it's it shows that where where this data splitting fits in so so usually when we set out to do modeling we have a a given data set so we we have a set of variables and and then we we have a set of uh like usually a, a, a data frame so a, a finite data set and based on that we would like to build a the best possible model so we should do within this data set the model training choosing what variables to keep and choosing what model to build and then also 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 evaluating so this this drawing is about like data splitting is usually after some some initial exploratory data data analysis or maybe data cleaning but before before any any model building so we have to uh, set aside a test set that we will only look at at, at the at the end of the modeling to to do a final evaluation and we will do the model tuning and feature selection and so on with with a subset of the data that the, tra the training set so this this chapter is is focuses on focuses on on this part uh, yeah, so it's 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 quite important to to not not look at the test set during model building because then you will you are quite likely to to overfit your model or 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 or. or, or, or or otherwise not not get a realistic estimate on how well your model would perform on on, on new data so it's it's for it's it's so that you can really uh, choose the best model that is that is that is also generalizing and not the best model on on this specific specific data uh, yeah, so this part is basically about why we do this so so we do this so that we have a realistic estimate on on how well our model performs or will perform on on new data later so uh, in in the simplest case which is quite common is where we have we have individual uh, data points and they are they are independent and, and there's no significant time component from from the from the modeling point of view. Then then we can do a, a random split, and there's a function called initial split uh, in the in the in the R sample package. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, let's let's see how that works. So so we have the the aims data set and the initial function the the initial split function is uh, splits the data into two pro two parts. The prop argument tells us how big the training uh set should be and then then the left is the test set 
and I was interested in how, how, so what kind of result is this? Because it does not give you back the training and test set immediately. You have to call a, a training function on this split object to, to get the training subset and, and the testing function to, to get the testing subset. So this is an, an efficient way to, to store this information. If, if we look at how it's, how it's implemented, uh, we can see that it stores the, the original data frame. And then it does not store two subsets, but it, 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 it only stores the raw IDs for the training set. So it's, it's just a way to to have, have, have all the information necessary for the training and test set without too much memory overhead. So it's, it's just, it, it was interesting for me, but, but, but if you use this, you only need to know that you call this, this initial split function and then uh, you call the training function to, to receive the training data and then you can work with that during modeling. Uh, yeah, it, it also tells you how many uh, data points are in the, well, it's, it, it, it uses different uh, names. So the training function will return the the analysis set also I, I i guess it's just an another name for that so so assessment is another name for the testing and 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 analysis is another name for for the training data set so so in this case is just just a uniform random splitting it's it's the most common so next the book discusses uh reasons where this this uniform random uh, splitting might not be suitable. So, so one example is, is class imbalance. So, uh, so it's, it's, it, it, it occurs when, uh, when there's maybe a, a factor variable or, or it can be can be any type, and its its its, it's distribution is 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 imbalanced, imbalanced or skewed. So, and then random splitting uh, can be problematic in a way that if if your sample size is not not very big, and and there's a huge imbalance, then there might be significantly more from your small class than in, in, in the in the training set or the, or the test set. Uh, so one example that, that another cohort found is a data set about uh, mountaineering expeditions. And it's about uh, uh, but it's it's quite grim. It's 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 about how many people and 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 who dies during an expedition, and it's an example where where around one percent of the data points uh, is is about dying. So it's 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 quite an imbalanced example. So let's see. So I I thought that it, it might be interesting to do to, to a small simulation. So, so the the R sample package, this this initial split function has an argument called strata. And you can uh, specify on which variable you would like to do stratified sampling. So it, it means that it will not do 
20% from the whole data set, but 20% from, from, e from each class. So it, it increases the likelihood that the test set will, will have a similar distribution than, than to the whole, whole data set. So we, we expect that, so with, without stratification, uh, we will have the same same expected value. So, so we will have the same the same expected proportion of people who who died in this example. But but sometimes it it, it will be lower and then sometimes it will be higher. And if if we, if we do stratified sampling, then it will be very close to the proportion in, in the in the data set so so the simulation is just uh, it does uh, like a, a, a toy data set uh, where you can uh, specify the proportion of of the smaller class and we do uh, this splitting without stratified something and then we do it with, with stratification where you have to specify the, the variable and then just see and then if, if you repeat this this sampling process then then you can say how how is the how, how does the proportion vary so but actually I started to do this and and for a lot of time i i did not understand why it doesn't work and then realized that 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 our sample will only do this if if it's if the where is it documented yes so so it will do this only if if the imbalance is not too extreme so if if, if it's more extreme than than 10 percent then actually it it won't won't do it. I'm I'm not quite sure why. Uh, so if, if you do it with a class imbalance of that is more extreme than than ten percent, then then stratification won't have have any effect. So so you you have have the variance if you do the repeated sampling. Sometimes you will have lower, and sometimes you will get higher means. But if, if the true proportion is higher than 10%, then, then if you do the stratification, then, then it, you won't have variance in, in the test set. So it, 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 will, it will always have the same, same proportion as the whole data set. Uh, I mean, I, I just did this to to see to see 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 how this works but it, it in in the so so behind the scenes it just does a re random sampling but but within each class separately and then and then pulls it together so so one one question i i have is why why is there this 10 percent limit do 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 any of you have have an idea maybe So one one thought that I had is maybe if, if there's a really is if, if there's a really extreme case, then even stratified sampling does not solve all your problems and then maybe this limit is not to so that you don't feel safe, too safe with this, but it's it's just a, it's just an idea. I, I, I'm not sure. I, I I mean I mean ten percent is 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 okay. I I'm I'm just not sure why is there a limit at all. So if if there's a limit, then then ten percent. 
I'm guessing the limit is really trying to just stop you from hurting yourself. <laughs> it's, I mean, it, nothing really stops you. But then if you if you don't have, I mean, so, I, so my thinking is they built tidy models to make this easy and more approachable with for other people. So doing that also means that you're going to end up with people who don't really understand how ML pipelines work. And if they just go through everything without really thinking about what's going on, um, this is like one of those stops that they would put in. Because in, in practice, if you have like a data set that's like 90 of one class and 10 of the other, and you fit a model, if it just, and if it just says like everything is spam email, it's 90% correct. And if you look at just model metrics and you don't really think about any of the steps in between, like you'll, you'll think you have a perfectly good model. So it seems like a pretty good heuristic as like 90% being like a good cutoff for like how correct a model would be. Yeah, that's a good point that you are not, uh, yeah, so so you must know what is in your data set and, and, and how to approach it. But but on the other hand, if if the the imbalance is, is not so, not so extreme then and and your, your your data set is not really small then then without stratification you still have a good enough a good enough split probably but but maybe there's a i think if you ever have like a class imbalance like that it's you should really stop and think about how to deal with it I think that's just like a general thing. And then probably the 10%, like the 10% cutoff is really just like, if you get this far and you still haven't like done something weird, like different to deal with your data set, like we're just gonna stop you from using this part of the tool chain because it's, we don't agree with it, <laughs> right? Because I can't, I can't imagine any scenario where I have a class imbalance of like, like even if it's like 80% um, where like, I don't have a serious discussion about how to deal with this. It, it, it like yeah and then at 90 percent is like what are you doing like how are you dealing with this <laughs> so it's probably their way of doing of blocking or stopping that yeah thanks yeah so yeah, so so we have seen this, and you can do a very similar thing if you don't if you have a continuous data, then you can create beans and and do the sampling within each each bean, usually I don't know quartiles of of your of your uh, data. It it might be relevant with the. Uh, again with the with a skewed distribution so it's 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 the same same way to do this yeah i was wondering on this snippet of code there's nothing in the documentation about how it is it always quartiles or can you specify it finer or coarser I didn't see anything uh, or was sale price a variable that they made? I couldn't tell. So I think sale price, we can check. So sale price is a variable in, in the data. And I think there, there there's some other argument which you can ref use to refine, but let's check. Uh, I see breaks, okay. Yeah, breaks. Uh, it says okay. number of beans. Okay. And it defaults to four. Okay, cool. Yeah. I missed that part. I was only reading about strata. <laughs> yeah, okay. it's it's scattered the documentation below between between the arguments and the details section. Yeah, I, I haven't experimented with that. But I guess if you give it to large number, then it will scream again. No. <laughs> uh, 
uh, yeah, so it seems it it does not give you a warning that maybe you shouldn't use that many breaks, but but in in the so so behind the scenes, it I think it's it's the similar that you cannot really use more than ten. Mm -hmm. But I, I think if if you again if if you really wanna do that. You can do it with by hand or, or so. <laughs> uh, so so you so so you were thinking about more beans, or you were thinking about not percentile based beans, but something else. No, I was just wondering if they had that functionality. I didn't really read very closely. It seems like. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm I'm not sure, but well, I I don't think that that you should really tweak at this level. So I think your like your train test split should be be as simple as as possible. But it, it just seems weird to to spend a lot of time on 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 how to how to split your test and train data. this case so the next quite big big part where where the simplest method of random split is is not suitable is when there's a significant time component so with with modeling you only want to use features and data from the past so uh, in in this case, it's it's really important to split split across time. So uh, there's a separate function for that. Uh, actually, you should already take care of 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 ordering your data. So as as you see, you don't even have to specify which which column has the date column, you may have several date columns. So you have to take care of, uh, of, of, of ordering your data. So this particular data set is a, is a monthly data set, I think. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's ordered based, it's, it's ordered already. And then initial time split well, it's it's quite interesting how I guess it just takes the first first given proportion of your I mean the first first rows to to satisfy the given proportion and this function which I haven't used yet it has an argument called lag and in that case, there will be uh, an overlap between. Yeah, so let's see. So the last part of this. Yes. So in, in this case, it's it's not two separate parts, the training and the test data. So the, uh, sorry, I may, yeah, it should. Yes, yeah, so the, the test data starts earlier than the, as does the train data ends, but it, it, it is because in many many time series modeling, you may have features like use the previous months or the previous six months data, and and in order to test your model in in the test data, you have to uh, create these features. So you may uh, create the feature I don't know the last 
six months and then actually you will only have prediction for the part of the test data that that is separate from from the training data so at, at first glance it seems like there's an overlap between the two data set but actually uh, after i guess you do your uh, features then you will only have prediction for the part that is that is later than your training data uh, So I noticed for that one, there's no, if you go back to the slides, there's no argument of proportion in this one. And I uh, looked it up and I think it defaults to three fourths. Uh, yes, it does. And I wonder why in the book, they, they talk about 80, 20 when the defaults to three fourths. And I wonder why they decided to go with three fours versus like I from what I've ever read, it's always 80-20. So I don't know what your guys is thinking of why they default to three fours. But I'm I I I have no idea to be honest. Uh yeah, they have have the same same uh Maybe they were thinking, oh, should it be 70 or, or 80? And then they decided in between. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe, maybe it's it's again what what kind of what Daniel said earlier that this way you have to think about it, and probably most people will will use 80, but then then they they have to make a conscious decision. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't think people would go low. Maybe people wouldn't go lower than three fours. Maybe that's a low bar. I don't want to imagine somebody going 60, 40. Maybe it's just like they're thinking of, well, that's our, we shouldn't expect you to go. Be, if you're going below is three fours, there must be some reason for doing so. Maybe they said, like Daniel said, in like the 10%, it's another thing. For people who aren't very, who don't use modeling that much, they might, you know, set the, the low bar if you, the low bar at three fours. Yeah, yeah, maybe I I haven't found anything in, in, in the book or the documentation about about this. I think they say it's it can be seventy, it can be eighty. Then why they settle with with. It's 75, I, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, and, and the fourth example, then, then the simple random sampling is, is not suitable, but it's actually not not discussed much more is that when you have uh, when you have uh, different data points that, that are actually really related together so so it's called the experimental unit or the the independent experimental unit and and uh, one example is uh, Is medical data when when you have uh, many data points from a single patient over time, and then maybe your data set, one row in your data set corresponds to uh, one one measurement of a patient, but when you randomize, you would like to keep uh, data related to one patient together. So I think you 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 have to think about how would you use it in 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 in, in real life for modeling. Uh, so if you know one patient's history and you want to predict for 
for that, then then you have to keep that that related data together. Uh, so in in general, this is called multi-level data. Uh, I just uh, just brought a, an example about. Uh, set of children's heights measured at different uh, ages and I, i'm not sure what the what the modeling task he, here is so i just wanted to try this how how would splitting work so i guess you just have to i i, I mean i I'm, I'm not sure but my my approach would be to to transform your data so that one row is is one one experimental unit then you can use the initial split function as, as you would do otherwise and then then you can go ahead and then transform your function maybe back so but i i'm i'm not sure if, if this is realistic or, or how you would go about it the important thing is that you realize if 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 the rows are not the not the independent are not the independent units, so this group nest function. So so the initial data is uh, we have uh, eight measurement from from a given child. The age is is normalized around twelve years old, and and we have their heights. We have a measurement ID, so this group nest function uh, creates one row for each child, and then puts all the all the other variables in in the data column in in a nested data frame, and in this data set we can we can use the initial split function. Uh, And then, then we can have the training data, and maybe unnest again if, if we wanna go ahead with that. Uh, yeah. I think the other way to go about it is to keep all the children and then split on like time. Instead of here, you sampled each individual children. So some children were left out. I guess it depends on what the goal is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great point. Yeah, I guess here it's. Yeah, so there's like, an important time component. We don't know what, what, what the modeling task is, but yeah. Yeah. I, I couldn't really think about an example when there's a multi-level data, but it's it's not time-based. Uh, but probably there is. Um, there's like that classic data set on schools, I think. I don't remember what it's called, but it's like they measure children in the same classroom over multiple classrooms. So you'd have like each classroom is the independent unit, but then you have all the children in the classroom. Uh, I don't remember what that data set is called. It's just called schools, I think. Yeah, it's from a book, so it might not be in R. Yeah, for me, it's it's kind of hard without uh, a modeling question to decide what what to do. So I mean, there are classes and children, and what would you like to predict, or 
Ja dem Mund auch. But in, in this case, we would uh, order based on age and then do an initial time split if, if we want to predict their, their height, yeah. Yeah, but would you have the nest um, measurement ID? Because this will arrange by the age, but uh, yeah, may, maybe measurement ID is better. Yeah. Replication, so you still have the same thing as before, where not everything is in one row. Uh, sorry, uh, could you repeat it? If you do the time split. But you have multiple like measurement ID one for all the children. Uh, yeah, so you wanna keep that together so so all the measurement ones are are in, in, in the training, you mean or yeah, like you Yeah, you... I, I think if you do it based on then you do the initial time split, it, it will do that much. Yeah, but if not all the... Ch you know, it doesn't really matter. Are you asking? <laughs> Is it, do you want to have like one... Do you want to nest by measurement ID so it's one... Every student is one row? So, you probably so that you don't have that duplicate, you can group, group by, by so each, each kid and then do the time split on each kid. So you avoid that duplication. So that you have like the same proportion time series for each of the kids. I mean, like usually like something I do is with space time. So like for each spatial location, I only keep like 50 years and then forecast than last year for every but for all spatial locations. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but just arranging by time and doing the first 80% doesn't necessarily give you the last year for every location or child. Yeah, 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 I, yeah. Is what I was point. trying to say. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's just so we don't necessarily have to code it yeah, yeah. right okay. now, but yeah. just another way to split it. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, it, it, it makes sense. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, so what I did first is was was ignoring the time component. So it's just uh, general yeah. multi-level data and then what you are saying is is realizing that this this has a ch the time component for for each child yeah i would say the first way you did it might be good in like a functional prediction if you want to predict like a height curve height age functional relationship mm -hmm. and then predict it for a new child their whole functional growth Whereas the other way might be just like a forecast for everybody involved. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so. So basically these are, these are the the two functions that that were were introduced and i guess it's 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 good to to familiarize uh, uh, ourselves with because then when we go to cross validation and things like that then then you do this within your training set over and over so it's 
it's, it's, it's a similar concept, but on, an, on another level. Well, this discussion is just about what we already said, that we have no idea why it's 80 or 70 or, or 75, but I, 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 kind of, I kind of like the, the argument that that 8020 works nicely with, with five forward consolidation. So it seems like, uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, an, an, a nice thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I, I guess, uh, What's important is that if, if you have a very large test set, then, then you don't have in, in, enough, enough data to, to build your model, or it's just like you could have an, a, a better model if, if you had more training data. And on, on, on the other hand, if, if your test set is too small, then, then you won't have a, a trust for fee way to, to know your true performance. But 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 other but otherwise it's it's not a scientific uh, way. I I I guess 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 other softwares have have different defaults. Maybe I don't know if if you used Python or or some 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 other tools and then maybe you see seventy thirty. I, I do agree that like the the point about 8020 working well with five fold cross validation that makes a lot of sense. And I know I was at a talk that Andreas Muller gave and he's one of the maintainers of scikit-learn in Python. Uh, and he advocates like, yeah, you see people give K for cross validation like five to 10 and he really just says like five is really all you need. Like in, in real world practice from his point of view, like five is really all you need. Um, and you don't need to, you don't need to put your computer or whatever system into more computational distress by put setting it to 10. It's, it, there's not that much you'll get, not, not that much more you'll get out of it given how much more time and effort you need to run those models. And so that sort of makes sense to build all of these proportions around five. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so this was the chapter, I think we will Yeah, so, so in, in a late, later chapter, there will be more about cross validation, and then we will visit similar topics again. Uh, yeah, that. Uh, so, Torin, do you? I I just kind of remember a tweet or something about a package that can be used for spatial sampling. Do you know anything about that? Um. No, I mean, usually I just will like code it myself or something, but usually in spatial statistics, things are kept, uh, I guess you would say wide, like space is the row and time is the columns. Mm -hmm. um, so it can make it a little bit easier to just subset it. Yeah. Um, but there might be like a tidy way to do it. I'm sure. Do you? I am not. I know like there's an entire ecosystem around spatial modeling and I'm, yeah. And tidy models is usually not something I think about when I think about spatial modeling things. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Because then, I, I, cause I, then I, your core data object is the SF object, right? And it, that's like a totally separate. And I'm pretty sure Max and Julia do not want to have to deal with that. <laughs> if they can get around it, I'm, I mean, they might have like, yeah. Cause like if even the use, types of models you fit are totally different. Like it's. Yeah. They use a lot of the like S4 objects in the spatial packages, mm -hmm. that, the big ones. So I don't know how well that would work with the tidyverse. I see. Which is more on the S3. But I don't know. I usually honestly just like hard code a lot of stuff that I do myself. <laughs> so uh, probably not the most efficient. But I was wondering, um, I don't know in this book if they talk at all about like data augmentation for class imbalance where you basically just like replicate I think Your that's samples to make it more balanced. Mm -hmm. I vaguely remember that there's something about oversampling. And I can... yeah, it might be under like waiting is like another way of dealing with it. Yeah, I, I wanted. Yeah, yeah, I was searching at the wrong place. That's why. Uh... Yeah, I I know. Like with imbalance classes, there's like there are many different ways in the entire analysis pipeline that you can deal with imbalances and different fields also call different points in time, like different things. Like in epidemiology, one way you deal with class imbalance is like you, you design your study as a case control. So like every person with like is matched with another person. So you have one-to-one -one and you force that to happen. And then um, the other ways you deal with it is like, if you already have the data set, you would do some kind of like weighting, um, and upsample, downsample as needed. Um, mm -hmm. like stratification is technically another way of dealing with that as well. And it's all like different points in time of the analysis, um, that you deal with like class imbalance. So there really isn't like a, if you have class imbalance, do this one thing, because like there's. You can deal with class imbalance if you know going in that you have this problem and you'll just like upsample your population. So like you don't even have this pro problem in your data. Um, so I guess that's that's why it always seems like it's all over the place because there's so many different ways you can deal with it. It, it seems there are functions for, for downsampling and, and upsampling. Do you know about about other sampling methods, or, or or is there anything else that that we should be aware about? Uh, I can't hear you, Chris. Uh, yeah, Chris, you. your audio is like not. It's something that's not Zoom related, because <laughs> you're unmuted in Zoom.
I think one thing that is interesting about all this sampling discussion is it's only on the output. But I think sometimes you have to think about, do you have like rare uh, combinations of inputs and things like that? Hmm. Interesting. I don't know. I mean, I can hear something from you, Chris. Uh, okay, does that work? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I think all I was trying to say was I don't think the um, next chapter on the recipes goes into any depth of, um, of this question of the different approaches that you might use to address these issues around the sample. Um, it more takes like an it's more an overview. And I think those the things about up something and down something is mentioned in that. Yeah. 